Hello and welcome to chapter 25, Bleeding and Shock. So we're going to cover the circulatory system a little bit. We're going to cover uh, bleeding and shock or hypoperfusion. So the circulatory system. Uh, remember what happens um, we get oxygenated blood that comes back to the left atrium um, and uh, goes down to the left ventricle and goes to the rest of the body where at the body it goes down to the capillary bed gets exchanged for CO2 um, and oxygen poor blood um, and it goes into the veins and then up into the right atrium, uh, right ventricle, and then back to the lungs through the uh, right pulmonary valve, right and left pulmonary valves, or veins. So um, just understand that. Okay, so it's got uh, three main components. We've got the heart, the blood vessels, and the blood. So the heart is the pump, the blood vessels are the container, and the blood is the fluid. So arteries uh, carry that oxygen rich blood away from the heart. Uh, it, they are comprised of thick muscular walls that enable dilation and constriction. Capillaries are the microscopic blood vessels um, that exchange the oxygen, the nutrients, um, and uh, get the carbon dioxide gets taken from the cells. Um, the veins carry the oxygen depleted blood rich uh, blood rich in carbon dioxide back to the heart. Uh, they contain one way valves to prevent backflow. Um, functions of the blood, uh, transportation of gases, nutri nutrition, excretion, remember the kidneys have to, the kidneys get filtered, uh, the kidneys filter the blood, sorry. Um, so you've got a, you've got all that excretion that's going on, um, and then protection and regulation. Uh, perfusion, um, it's the adequate circulation of blood throughout the body. Um, hypoperfusion is the inadequate perfusion of blood, the body's tissues and organs. All right, so bleeding. So there's types of bleeding. So we've got hemorrhage is severe bleeding. Um, that's the major cause of shock in trauma. Um, so there's external and internal hemorrhage. External bleeding, it looks like this. Um, so we've got some arteries here that um, there's a spurting blood flow, pulsating flow, uh, bright red color. Um, if it's spurting bright red blood um, we've got to stop that immediately though that means that it's arteries um, because the spurting means that um, it's going with the pulse so you've got to make sure that we stop that right away uh, veins are a steady flow um, that's a dark red color and capillaries uh, are a slow, even flow. Um, it occurs outside of the body after a force penetrates the skin or lacerates and uh, destroys the underlying blood vessels. <clears throat> it's typically visible on the surface of the skin. Um, and how much a person bleeds is determined by size and severity of the wound, size and pressure of ruptured vessels, and the individual's ability to clot. Uh, massive hemorrhage is typically this arterial bleeding. It's that bright red color spurting with the heartbeat. It's oxygen rich and it's most difficult to control. Um, venous bleeding is darker in color than arterial bleeding. There's less pressure than arterial bleeding. Um, the volume of blood Carried by some veins can create immediate life-threatening hemorrhage. So, um, if there is a damage to a large vein, then we can have life-threatening hemorrhage. 
Uh, capillary bleeding. It's caused by su superficial wounds to the surface of the skin. It's slow and oozing, and it stops spontaneously. Um, so bleeding can be accelerated by other conditions. Um, prescription medications designed to limit the, the body's natural ability to form cl blood clots, such as blood thinners. Um, and hypothermia can also affect the body's uh, ability to clot. <clears throat> so let's think about this. Um, how severe is the bleeding? Is it exsanguinating hemorrhage? If so, how does that affect the priorities of treatment? So exsanguinating hemorrhage is based, basically it's like flowing, 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 you can't get it stopped. Um, and uh, you've got to try and figure out how to get it to stop. So exsanguinating is that life-threatening hemorrhage. Um, they're going to bleed out, okay? So assessment and care. Um, we use standard precautions. Uh, ensure that you have an open airway and ensure adequate breathing. Uh, control bleeding only after assessing and treating prior elements. Um, be aware of signs and symptoms of shock. Use direct pressure elevation, uh, a hemostatic agent, which is um, like uh, quick clot. Um, comes in, uh, it's basically a drug um, dosed in, dosed on a, onto a uh, Carlex, okay. Um, or we can use a, a tourniquet to control bleeding. Uh, so direct pressure, apply firm pressure to the wound with gloved hand and gauze bandage. Uh, hold pressure until bleeding is controlled. If necessary, add dressings when uh, lower ones are saturated. Do not take that dressing off. You've got to place it on top because remember what the blood has in it it's got all those uh, blood clotting factors and and various things and the body says hey I need some blood clotting up here so uh, it sends those blood clotting factors up to that that area um, and it starts to create that blood clot well if we take the dressing off of it then what we're essentially doing is removing all of those blood clots that have just formed so now the body has to fight to create more blood clots uh, so once the bleeding is controlled bandage or dressing firmly in place to form a pressure dressing uh, never remove bandages even when bleeding is controlled and when controlled check for a pulse distal to the wound to make sure that the dressing has been applied has not been applied too tightly Direct pressure, uh, so a pressure dressing is uh, where we place several gauze pads on the wound. Hold the dressings in place with a self-adhering roller bandage wrapped tightly over the dressings and the up, up and above and below the uh, wound site. Uh, create enough pressure to control bleeding. Oh, excuse me. Um, elevation. So elevate the injured extremity above the level of the heart while applying direct pressure. Uh, do not elevate if musculoskeletal injury, um, impaled objects uh, in the extremity or uh, spine injury is, is suspected. Um, hemostatic agents, these are designed to enhance direct pressure's ability to control the bleeding. Um, they work by applying a material designed to absorb liquid uh, portion of the blood and leave larger formed elements to clot. Um, it originated as powders, um, but does not include um, dressings and gauze bandages. Um, manual pressure is always necessary. Okay, so this is quick clot. Uh, there is... Um, that hemostatic agent is on this gauze pad. So a tourniquet is for use if bleeding is uncontrollable by direct pressure. Uh, 
Um, only use on extremity injuries and always apply between the wound and the heart. Okay, so this is a mechanical advantage uh, tourniquet. Um, you'll be kind of hard pressed to actually see one of these. Um, we typically, any kind of EMS service is going to carry a cat tourniquet or even a SWAT T tourniquet. And we'll go over those in the skill session. Um, but, uh, yeah, typically you're going to see a, a, a cat tourniquet. <clears throat> so follow the manufacturer's instructions and once applied, uh, do not remove or loosen. Uh, attach notation to the patient alerting other providers to the tourniquet has been placed. Let's go back here. Um, so the tourniquet should be placed at least two inches above the wound um, to be able to, to stop that bleeding. Um, and we do want to basically apply the tourniquet until the bright red bleeding has stopped. Okay. Um, I'm going to go forward just to see something here in just a second. Nope. Okay. So uh, the way it's applied is it, it gets placed on, uh, it gets hooked up into here. The cat tourniquet is Velcro. So it gets applied uh, using the Velcro strap. Um, and then this is uh, this plastic piece that he's turning is called a windlass. Um, so in order to have a tourniquet, you have to have a windlass. You can't just be like, you know, tightening it tight, tying it really, really tight. Um, you have to have that wind windlass. Um, so what happens is that windlass gets turned, turned, turned until the bright red bleeding stops. Okay. Um, and then we mark the time, uh, somewhere on the patient, um, or on the, the device itself. Sometimes we'll have something. So is the current method of bleeding control working? Uh, do you need to move to a more aggressive step and how would you evaluate this? So, um, when we talk about... Uh, when we talk about uh, efficacy or, you know, is this efficient enough for this bleeding? Um, have we tried everything? You know, have we placed bandages? Have we done direct pressure? Have we elevated the wound? Um, if we haven't, then we've got to figure something out. We need to go more aggressive. Okay. Um, you know, do those more aggressive things. Do not waste time on evaluating. Uh, you've got to be quick about your evaluation. Um, but don't waste time on that evaluation. Okay? Because the more they bleed out, the worse they're going to get. Uh, so a systemic, systematic approach to treat uncontrolled external hemorrhage. Um, recommendations from the College of Surgeons um, begin with direct pressure if not applied uh, if not controlled apply the tourniquet if ineffective and wound on the trunk or head apply a hemostatic dressing or bandage with uh, direct pressure do not place a hemostatic dressing on the head um, Splinting, so stabilizing sharp ends of broken bones, uh, inflatable air splints, cold application, minimizes the swelling, constricts blood vessels, and reduces pain. It's used in conjunction with other manual techniques. Um, I know that me personally, if I start an IV and it blows because of, you know, something in the vein happened in the vein or whatever, um, <coughs> and they're all blood thinners. Even me starting that IV, uh, I mean, they just bleed like a stuck pig. So um, I'll take a cold pack and place it on there. Um, so just to kind of help reduce that, uh, that bleeding. Um, head injuries. So from increased in intracranial pressure, not direct trauma to the ears or nose. Um, stopping bleeding only increases intracranial pressure. Um, we want allow we want to allow the drainage to 
flow freely using a gauze pad to collect it. Uh, nosebleeds or epistaxis. Um, have the patient sit and lean forward. Apply direct pressure to the fleshy portion of the nostrils. Keep the patient calm and quiet. Do not let the patient lean back. Um, and if the patient becomes unconscious, place the patient in a recovery position and be prepared to suction. Okay. These patients, if they do become unconscious for whatever reason, um, can, uh, they don't have control of their own airway anymore. So all of that blood that is coming from their nose is now going into their throat, into their stomach, uh, possibly even into their airway. So we've got to be aware that, that we need, may need to suction. Um, epistaxis can be a life-threatening problem, um, especially if the patient is on uh, blood thinners. Um, and it typically will be related to like a um, uh, hypertension, okay? So hypertension is one of those things that uh, when, when you look at it, seems fairly benign, but uh, when that patient has that nosebleed, um, we need to, to be aware of it. Uh, so damage to the internal organs and large blood vessels uh, can result in loss of a large quantity of blood in a short time uh, for internal bleeding. Blood loss commonly cannot be seen um, and severe blood loss can result uh, from injuries to extremities. So some, some examples of our extremities getting injured would be our femur. Um, if we were to have a femur fracture and that femur fracture were to um, cut the uh, femoral artery, uh, we can lose a large amount of blood in that femoral artery. Um, you're looking at probably five to 600 mLs um, of blood loss in, in that femoral artery. We carry two liters of blood uh, normally. Um, so five to 600 liters or five to 600 mLs of blood is, is a lot. Um, and uh, the way we kind of fix that hopefully is by taking our traction splint, placing it on that leg and um, pulling it back into the position that it was supposed to be in. Um, so patient assessment. So mechanics, mechanisms of blunt injury that may cause internal bleeding. So we're going to look for any of these things. Falls, motor vehicles, uh, or motorcycle crashes, auto pedestrian crashes, collisions, uh, blast injuries, uh, gunshot wounds, stab wounds, uh, impaled objects. Okay. So signs of internal bleeding. So injuries uh, to the surface of the body, uh, bruising, swelling, or pain, or other vital uh, over vital organs, uh, painful, swollen, or deformed extremities, bleeding from the mouth, rectum, or vagina. Uh, tender, rigid, distended abdomen, uh, vomiting, coffee ground like substance, uh, or bright red vomit. Um, <clears throat> dark, tarry stools, or a bright red blood in the stool. Um, also, signs and symptoms of shock. Okay, so bruising is one of these signs uh, of internal bleeding. So even though this may not be um, systemic and it may not cause a lot of problem, bruising is a sign of internal bleeding. There's, it may be just like localized to the area that was impacted, um, but it's still internal bleeding. Okay, so we're going to maintain our AVCs, administer high concentration oxygen, um, control any external bleeding, uh, take, take steps to preserve body temperature, provide prompt uh, transport to the appropriate medical facility. All right, so let's watch this video. Evaluation of circulation forms a critical part of your initial assessment. If blood is not adequately circulated, some of the cells and organs in the body will not receive an adequate supply of oxygen 
and dangerous waste products will begin to build up. If the problem is not corrected, shock will occur. Severe bleeding or hemorrhage is one of the most common causes of shock. Signs of shock include restlessness or anxiety, pale, cool, and or clammy skin, nausea and vomiting, tachycardia and tachypnea, and as a very late sign, hypotension. Take BSI precautions. This is important because there may be direct contact with possible bloodborne pathogens. Use gloves and goggles at a minimum, a gown for gross hemorrhage, and a mask or face shield for spurting blood. Expose the wound and estimate the amount of blood lost by the patient. Apply firm direct pressure to the wound with a gloved hand and gauze pads or other dressing material. Bleeding from a neck or chest wound should be controlled with an occlusive dressing that prevents any air from entering the wound site. Occlusive materials include any non-breathable substance, such as a gloved hand, Vaseline gauze, or plastic wrap. If bleeding is controlled and does not seem to be seeping through the bandages or coming up through your fingers, then bandage the dressing in place with roller gauze, elastic bandages, triangular bandages, or cravats. To ensure uniform contact and pressure over the wound, wrap a pressure dressing from distal to proximal. Assess distal circulation to ensure that the bandage was not applied too tightly. The intent is to maintain control of the bleeding with continued pressure. If firm, consistent, direct pressure fails to control the hemorrhage, a tourniquet should be applied. A tourniquet can be any material two to four inches wide that can be wrapped tightly around the extremity, but commercial devices are the most successful tourniquets because they have a built-in windlass that allows for proper tightening and continued constriction of the band. Apply the tourniquet at least two inches above the wound site and tighten as much as possible. Twist the windlass until bleeding has stopped and distal pulses are no longer palpable. If the tourniquet is not applied tight enough, it will actually increase venous bleeding, similar to when a constricting band is applied for blood draws or IV initiation. For very large or muscular patients, two tourniquets placed next to each other may be required to control hemorrhage. Secure the windlass in place with a strap that covers the windlass, ensuring it will not release the tension you have already applied. Document the time the tourniquet was applied. Some systems want this information literally marked on the patient's forehead so as not to be missed. Now that the hemorrhage has been controlled, you can begin to treat for shock. Appropriate treatment for shock includes properly positioning the patient supine, maintaining the airway and administering high flow oxygen, reassuring the patient to reduce anxiety, and preventing heat loss by applying a blanket. Prepare the patient for transport and monitor vital signs. All right, so let's talk about shock and hypoperfusion. Um, so remember our anatomy, regular perfusion, blood flows through the body, through the vessels, to the capillaries, it gets exchanges, okay? Um, we call that good tissue perfusion. Um, if we don't have that tissue perfusion, then we have shock, okay? We have inadequate tissue perfusion. Um, it also causes the inadequate removal of those waste products from the cells. Uh, so causes of shock, so it's the failure of any component of the circulatory system. So the heart, that pump, um, it loses the ability to actually work and, and, and pump the blood to where it needs to go. Um, the blood vessels, they dilate, making that, uh, uh, that container too big to fill. Um, and uh, blood, okay, so losses uh, from the volume of, from the bleeding or the fluid, okay. So um, uncontrolled shock leads to... Whoa, Okay, let's start here. Um, pulse increases to maintain cardiac output. Um, blood vessels constrict, causing pale, clammy skin. Uh, the respiration rate increases. The blood is shunted away from the gastrointestinal organs, causing nausea. And decreasing blood pressure is a late sign of shock. And then it leads to um, uncontrolled shock, which leads to death.
So compensated versus decompensated shock. So in compensated shock, the body senses the decrease in perfusion and attempts to compensate for it. So again, these are the early signs of shock. So the blood shunts uh, blood away from the um, <clears throat> from the organs. Okay, the the non vital organs. So uh, the stomach, the um, intestines. All of that gets all of that blood gets shunted away from that, and it gets pushed to other organs that need it. Um, decompensated shock um, is when the body begins to no longer compensate for that low blood volume or lack of perfusion, and we're, we're talking about light, late signs of of, of shock in um, the body. So that that low blood pressure. Um, the respiration rates, all of those things, okay? <coughs> Hypovolemic shock. Uh, so this results from a decreased volume of, of circulating blood and plasma. Um, it's called hemorrhagic shock if caused by uncontrolled bleeding, um, internal or external, and can be caused by burns or crush injuries or severe dehydration. Okay, so hypovolemic shock means that we don't have enough fluid in the body. Cardiogenic shock <clears throat> is seen in patients suffering an MI. Um, it results from the inadequate pumping of blood by the heart, decreasing strength of contractions. Um, the heart's electrical malfunction may, uh, sorry, the electrical system may malfunction, causing the heartbeat to, uh, to go too slow, too fast, or irregular. So this is a pump problem. Neurogenic shock uh, results from uncontrolled dilation of the blood vessels causing uh, because of nerve paralysis. Um, there's no blood loss, but the vessels dilate so that they can't fill uh, with blood. Um, it's rarely seen in the field. It's, it's, it takes a while for it to actually take effect. Um, neurogenic shock is a container problem. Okay. So on a pediatric note, um, infants and children, inf efficient compensating mechanisms maintain blood pressure until half of the volume is depleted. Uh, potential for shock must be recognized and treated before telltale signs uh, appear. Um, children and infants compensate for shock much better than adults do, um, and their bodies just compensate a whole lot better than we do. Um, so they're issues and stuff like that won't be seen until um, later on. <coughs> so progression of signs and symptoms of shock, so altered mental status, pale, cool, clammy skin, nausea and vomiting, vital sign changes, late signs of shock include thirst, dilated pupils, and sometimes cyanosis around the lips and nail beds. So our care for shock, we're going to transport um, uh, every minute between the time of injury and the patient's getting to an operating suite is in fact like gold to the patient. Um, so we have this golden hour, okay? So that golden hour, um, that golden hour is something that we need to um, take into consideration when we treat for shock and treat a trauma patient. Um, these patients need definitive care. Um, I can only do so much in the back of an ambulance, even as a paramedic, uh, for these patients, but uh, their definitive care is a hospital, a surgery suite. Um, I can get them ready for surgery um, and uh, make sure that they make it to surgery, um, but they ultimately need that surgery. Um, so goal is that platinum 10 minutes at the scene. We want to limit our scene time to 10 minutes, nothing more. Um, so that way that patient has the best chance of survival because it's not that golden hour. It's that golden hour from when it actually started um, to, you know, death. Um, so we've got to get that we you know we want to limit our scene time um as well on these patients on these trauma patients 
Um, and then we're going to prevent heat loss, coagulopathy, and uh, further blood loss. So we want to prevent any kind of thing that may um, push our patient into shock further. Uh, maintain an open airway and assess uh, respiratory rate, address inadequate breathing and immediately and aggressively. Um, if the patient is breathing adequately, apply high concentration of oxygen by non-rebreather mask. Control any external bleeding. Um, if, the patient, if, the, if the patient has a pelvic fracture su 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 suspected, use a pelvic binding device. Okay. Um, a pelvic binding device is kind of like a, a big, huge SAM splint that uh, uh, wraps around the patient's pelvis. We can use a sheet as well, um, and when we get into skills, I'll show you um, both. Um, but the main thing that we use is a, is a sheet for those, those patients. <clears throat> so we're going to splint any suspected uh, bone or joint injuries. Prevent loss of body heat, uh, transport the patient immediately, and speak in a calm and reassuring uh, voice throughout the assessment and care. Alright, so let's watch this video on shock. Shock, or hypoperfusion, is the inability of the circulatory system to supply cells with oxygen. In early stages, symptoms occur as the body attempts to compensate for blood loss. Physiological causes of shock are the heart failing to pump, loss of blood volume, or blood vessels dilating, creating a vascular container capacity that is too great to be filled by available blood. Categories of severity are compensated shock, presents as an increased heart rate, increased respiration, and constriction of peripheral circulation, which results in pale, cool skin, and in infants and children, increased capillary refill time. Decompensated shock starts with low blood volume or lack of perfusion. Symptoms include falling blood pressure. Shock is irreversible when perfusion to the organs cannot be restored. Cell damage occurs, especially in the liver and kidneys. Even if vital signs are restored, irreparably damaged organs may cause death. All right, so I kind of hope that explains shock a little bit. Um, we'll talk about shock, shock throughout the chapters um, and uh, kind of give you an idea of how that works. Um, so we'll go on to the chapter review. So almost all external bleeding can be controlled by direct pressure and elevation. When these do not work, we want to apply that tourniquet. Um, if the bleeding is on an extremity or hemostatic dressing if the bleeding is from the head or torso. Emergency care for internal bleeding is based on prevention and treatment of shock. Okay? We have to treat that shock as soon as possible. Um, <coughs> we want to treat that shock as soon as possible. Um, we want to make sure that we treat based on even the mechanism of injury um, and uh, make sure that we treat uh, early. So early signs of shock are often restlessness, anxiety, pale skin, rapid pulse and respirations. If shock is uncontrolled, the patient's blood pressure falls, which is a late sign of shock. You will probably not see this sign of shock in the field. Um, so it is a late sign of shock. Do not rely on that as your determining factor of whether or not you're going to treat your patient because you need to treat your patient back way, 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 way back in the early stages of shock. Um, so signs and symptoms may, may not be evident early in the call. So treat, uh, based on mechanism of injury, um, and it may be life-saving. Treat shock by maintaining the airway, administering high concentration oxygen, controlling bleeding, and keeping the patient warm. One of the most important treatments is early recognition of shock and immediate transport to a hospital. Okay, so remember that golden hour. Um, they have to start getting that treatment as soon as possible, that definitive care. <clears throat> 
Um, the circulatory system is designed to ensure adequate perfusion of body tissues. Remember, we've got the pump, we've got the container, and we've got the, um, the fluid. Okay, so if there's a problem with any one of those three, then we've got a huge problem. All right. Uh, the classification of hemorrhage is directly related to the uh, type of blood, a vessel ruptured and the pressure within that vessel. Um, treatment of external hemorrhage includes progression throughout the following steps. Um, direct pressure, elevation, tourniquet application, and use of hemostatic agents. Um, internal bleeding is impossible to evaluate. Uh, the most appropriate treatment must be to rapidly transport to an appropriate facility. Shock develops if the heart fails, blood volume is lost, or blood vessels dilate, uh, resulting in an in inadequate perfusion. Um, signs of shock reflect the body's attempts to compensate for inadequate perfusion. The most significant treatment for the shock patient is early recognition and prompt transport to a patient to a hospital where they will receive that definitive care. So again these questions just look at them uh, make sure that uh, you can answer them as we go through um, as you finish up the your studies in the in this chapter um, so what can I use for a tourniquet that will control bleeding but will not damage the tissue when treatment when treating a patient with shock what should I do at the scene and what should I do en route to the hospital If a patient uh, with pale is a patient with pale, cool skin, tachycardia, and rapid, shallow respirations and shock, or just under stress, how will continuing assessment help me in making that decision? So let's look at this. Um, so you have a patient who has been involved in a motor vehicle collision. There is considerable damage to the vehicle. The steering column and wheel are badly deformed. The patient complains of a sore chest. And you note no external bleeding. The patient's vital signs are pulse 116, respirations 20, blood pressures 106 over 70. Um, how would you proceed to assess the, and care for this patient? Okay, so how are we going to do this? So the patient um, Complains of a sore chest, but no external bleeding. So we, we don't necessarily need to control any kind of bleeding. Um, but if he's got a sore chest, we want to look at that chest and make sure that we've got, uh, see if we've got any bruising to the chest. If we do, then we probably got some internal bleeding. Um, in the chest area especially, we don't want blood. <clears throat> um, we don't want that blood to, to be there. So this patient is a high priority. Um, their vital signs are good and stable for now. Um, he's compensating, um, but we're going to be on the lookout for shock, um, and even start potentially treating for, for shock, depending on if we've got any kind of bruising or anything on the chest. Um, so we want to make sure that we start treating for shock, um, that we're hyper vigilant about treating for shock and that um, we get our patient to definitive care as soon as possible um, or ALS okay all right so if you guys have any questions comments um, anything let me know and I will answer those you can call me email me text me um, and I'll see you on the next lecture